today's video, we're following up on the Poncade project. We'll be walking through all the steps to manufacture all the parts that we designed in the last video. Stick around. Welcome back. In this video, we'll be walking through the steps of fabricating all the parts for the Poncade project. If you're not sure what that is, check out the previous video where we designed and talked about the concept of the desktop arcade system. In this video though, we, we've got lots of different parts to make. Three, some are 3D printed, some are laser cut, some are resin printed, some are CNC milled. And to get started, let's hop over into Fusion 360 and start generating some tool packs. All right, over in Fusion 360, we're looking at the Poncade. Now this is the uh, rendering, basically the assembly of what we're gonna be generating. And if you recall, there's several parts that need to be fabricated. First of which is the face, which is made from acrylic. So if we isolate that, you'll see it's just a chunk of acrylic, eighth inch thick. It's got a couple slots for those sliders, and then it's got this engraved uh, logo at the top. Now keep in mind, this isn't the actual representation. It's not gonna have this printed on there or anything. That's just to simulate what the matrix should look like in the final product. All right, so let's unisolate that. And this will be laser cut. So in order to do the laser cut, all we have to do is generate a sketch as a reference and export it as a DXF. I've already done that, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so we've got this sketch here. And in the sketch, I'm just referencing the obje objects. Everything in the sketch is just a reference to the, the physical object. And so once that sketch is complete, all we have to do is export it. And to that, we just go right-click on it, save as DXF, and then we'll be able to use that DXF in Lightburn. So if we hop over into Lightburn and import that, you can see I've already imported it here. You really just have a DXF, um, the, which has your cut pattern, as well as um, the area for the text, which is gonna be laser engraved. And the only thing I needed to do here is to select that text and then select the, uh, the settings to do the laser engraving as opposed to the cut. And you see everything that's in black is just gonna be cut at 75% power and the yellow is going to be engraved or filled with 30% power. And you can set all the, the details and specifics about the type of cut and the angle and lines per inch and all of the, the scan angle and all that fun stuff if you need to customize it. But I'm just accepting the defaults here and we're good to go. So this will be ran over on my uh, 40 watt laser. So it's just a matter of selecting all of this and hitting start. All right, while the laser cut acrylic looks great, this is the wrong material, and we'll have to talk about that. Uh, for now, this will just be used as a placeholder to, to assemble all the other components. Originally, I had planned on using material from Cap Plastics. That's the darker one on the right. I found it cheaper at Adafruit and ordered some, and as you can see, uh, the one on the left from Adafruit is far different than uh, the one from Cap Plastics. The transmissivity, it's, it's almost like translucent, uh, plexi, and you can see right through it. Uh, the darker one from Cap Plastics is much darker in the real aesthetic that I was going for in this project. Putting them next to each other on top of the aluminum, you can see the aluminum right through the uh, Adafruit version of the LED acrylic, and that's just not going to work. Putting them on top of the matrix shows you in, from another perspective that the transmission is about the same for both of them, but with the lighter one, there's much more diffusion and you can see through it. Um, so I really want to go with that darker one. But the thought occurred that there is a possibility of a, a third alternative. And that's really just using bronze acrylic with a sheet of paper under it. Now the only problem is that you can see the paper grain in the diffused layer. Uh, and that compared to the Adafruit, you know, it's, it's still much darker. Uh, and I like the way that looks, but the transmission on the tap plastics version is much better. So even though this acrylic and paper will work, I'm going to go with the tap plastics. And so that's going to be a couple days before we get that material. All right. So back in Fusion 360, now that the acrylic's taken care of, we'll laser cut that plastic. 
there's a few other parts that need to be made. Next is the pixel isolation grid. So you see the pixels down in there. We've got this black matrix, if you will. And you see it's just a grid that has a countersunk bottom that the matrix or the LED pixel matrix will fit up in. Uh, and this matrix is just evenly spaced. It's about four millimeters tall and it isolates and diffuses uh, those cells from one another um, so that there is no light bleed into the neighboring pixel uh, cells. So that said, this is just going to be flipped over and we're going to 3D print this on the TAS. And then we'll go to the grid, right click and save as mesh. All right, over in Simplify 3D, that's what I'm going to use to slice um, for my FDM prints. I always do that. Because of the orientation in Fusion, you see it comes in a little wonky and it's wrong side up. So we need to flip this around. And so the easiest way to do that is to just go into Edit and then Place Surface on Bed. The surface that you want on the bed is this top surface. So if we select a polygon from the top, it's flipped it over and put it on the bed. Now that's the correct side because we know that we have this channel that we want to face upward. And so with that, I'm just going to slice it on the uh, 0.8 hot end and we're good to go. It's going to take about an hour. Uh, we'll run through that on the machine and it, then we'll have our isolation grid for the pixels. All right, well, that was fast. And when we we're complete, we have this pixel isolation grid, which is going to be used to prevent light leaks between the RGB nodes in the matrix. So with that, that'll give us a clear separation of pixels. And you can see how that just fits right over it as an overlay. And this will be um, butted up against the LED acrylic. Piece of cake. Before we get too far, electronic projects always start with good circuit designs. And for that, I rely on Altium Designer. From simple to complex, if you haven't taken a chance to download a free copy and see what you're missing, I've put links in the description. And with Altium Designer, creating these complex projects is a piece of cake. Through your development, you'll be empowered to do your best work as you grow into its more advanced capabilities. The link in the description below will allow you a free trial version of the software so that you can check it out and see what Enterprise Class ECAD feels like. Now back to the overview. All right, back in Fusion 360 with the grid printed and complete. Uh, next, we have a couple more things to do. So let's unisolate this grid, flip it back around. We can hide the grid now. Let's get rid of that matrix while we're at it. We've got this body, which will be resin printed. And then we've got the top part that's milled from aluminum. There's nothing special about this other than it's going to be milled from a chunk of aluminum. Um, there are no undercuts, so this can be milled with mostly 2D operations. Um, the only thing unique about this is how are we going to fixture this on the machine? And the easiest way to manage that within Fusion is to create a solid model that represents your stock. And so in this case, you can see this ghosted image, which I have set to 50% uh, opacity. And you can see the two mount holes in the middle. This will be how I'll fixture it on the machine. Won't need to use any hold downs or anything like that. I'll just put two M6 bolts through there directly on the CNC bed, and then we'll mill everything out around that. Um, through that process, obviously, uh, we'll need to leave some tabs so that it can remain attached to the centerpiece, which will not be milled. That said, this solid or this uh, stock solid model will be used in the, the generation of toolpaths. And so to do that, <clears throat> There's also a couple other things that I'll need, and some of those will be sketches um, for the containment boundaries. And for that, you can see that if I just use the objects themselves, then I would be uh, milling out a lot. So I use these sketches as containment boundaries for the, the tool, so that when I have to mill out this inner area, I'm only going to mill out this channel, which it goes around the perimeter so that all of this aluminum in the middle will not be milled. That's going to save a lot of time. And obviously, your end mill can't be hitting where your, uh, your cap head bolts are holding down the stock. So um, this will be a keep out zone. And we'll also use this as a keep out. Uh, and then we'll just mill in the approved area here, um, the valid milling area for the adaptive clearing operations. And we'll step into that.
So to do that, we hop over into the manufacturer environment. Now there's several operations that need to be performed to mill this on the EVO 1 CNC. First, I'm going to mill the mount holes in this uh, piece of stock. And so first things first, I need some way to mount it. I'm going to bore those down. To do that, I will hold down the stock with uh, hold down clamps, and then we'll mill those two holes out. But once those two holes are there, it's getting mounted with M6 directly onto the table, and the rest of the operations will uh, just avoid those bolts. Once it's bolted down, we'll do a facing operation. Again, using the sketch as the keep out zone, it's just going to face the areas that are going to be uh, finished. We'll step through a contour operation, and that's where we cut away all of the material outside of the, uh, the region of the, the actual part. Then we'll do an adaptive clearing operation. It's a 3D adaptive, which is going to mill down uh, and open up those tabs where the, the face will the mount to the body. Then we're going to mill the flat areas. And we'll run a contour to finish up the internals of that. And then we'll cut it out, but we will leave several tabs. These are like six millimeter tabs around the part in order to hold it in place. And finally, we'll mill out these holes, which are the mount holes on the part. And lastly, run a chamfer around the top edge just to clean it up. Now let's hide the stock real quick, and then we'll talk about the feeds and speeds. Hiding the stock as well as that sketch. All right, with the sketches and stock uh, hidden, then you get a much better look at the part and we'll step through the feeds and speeds that were used for that. For the mount holes, that's trivial. We drilled a couple holes. Um, for the facing operation, this was ran with a quarter inch two flute flat end mill and that same end mill was used for all of the quarter inch operations. Um, this was ran at 18,000 RPMs with uh, 900 millimeters per minute at a step down of 0.5 millimeters. Tool deflection really wasn't an issue in the facing operation, uh, but generally I would run that a little slower. Um, and we'll see that in the upcoming operations. Outside contour here was ran a couple times. The first time it was ran at uh, 20,000 RPMs at 685 with a step down of 0.25 millimeters with a 0.3 millimeter stock to leave so that there was some room to come back and clean it up. It was ran again uh, with a two millimeter step down with the same end mill at 18,000 RPMs to clean up that edge with no stock to leave. Um, that cleaned out all the tool deflection. Next was the inside adaptive, which was also done with the quarter inch two flute flat end mill, ran at 19,000 RPMs, 1,000 millimeters a minute, at 0.25 millimeter step down with a 0.3 millimeter uh, stock to leave. That gave me some wiggle room to clean up for the tool deflection that I would get, but I ended up running this, uh, even though it was at 1,000 uh, millimeters a minute, I ended up running that because it's only 0.25, able to run at almost 190% of that, so you know, 1,900 millimeters a minute at uh, 0.25. It was nice, it kept the finish clean, didn't have a lot of tool deflection, um, and that's largely due to the step down, the, and while still retaining a, a reasonably good material removal rate because of that high feed. Uh, once the adaptive was complete, I came back and hit the flats uh, with that quarter inch, again, using a 0.25 step down, 18,000 uh, RPM uh, to clean up those top surfaces. Finally, I ran this uh, 2D contour and left some tabs. Those are four millimeter tabs. I believe they were at a 7.5 millimeter uh, spacing, and that would allow me to finish that inside pocket without disconnecting it from its fixture. So with the fixture complete, then I ran a 1.5 millimeter two flute flat end mill to mill out these three millimeter holes. There was the four of those. Just ran those with the boring operation, and then finally came back with a quarter inch 45 degree chamfer and broke that top outer edge on the body. All right, once the part was complete, we removed the two M6 bolts to clean out the particles and then lift it from the plate. You can see the 3D printed risers that I used underneath. It worked out really well. 
Over on the workbench, I used a file to remove the tabs and level them out. And then I progressively polished it with um, from fine to ultra fine grit sandpapers that go to about 1200 grit. And with the sanding complete, then it was time to take it over to the, the buffing wheel with some Meguiar's aluminum polish. And that would uh, bring the finish to a near mirror like finish, which is what we were going for in this particular project. And with that, the top body was complete. With its mirror-like finish and recessed top area for the acrylic, the most challenging part for this build was complete. All right, with the body complete, it was time to uh, unisolate this. And let's look at the base. So the base is uh, actually going to be printed from resin. And to do that, uh, let's isolate it so you can see sort of uh, any complexities to it. As you can see, there are no undercuts here, so no supports are necessary. And this is the type of model that, and maybe I uh, subconsciously designed it this way, that this could be right on the print bed. You know, no supports. I hate supports. They just damage the surface quality of resin prints. So when at all possible, I avoid them. Uh, in this case, there are no real undercuts or significant undercuts internally either, other than these. but. As this is printing, there'll be plenty of support available to uh, you know, pick it up and allow it to successfully print without having any supports built into it. Um, pretty solid walled. Um, I would say it's two millimeters. These sides are about four millimeters thick. Uh, and I did hollow out some of it, but you know, for the most part, I was just gonna run this straight off of the print bed. And to do that, obviously, we first need to export it or save it as a mesh. To slice this for the resin printing, I use the Lychee Slicer Pro. In this case, you know, it's one of my favorites. has the best visualization. It works with the 3D connection space mouse. Uh, it really makes it easy and uh, useful to uh, be productive in. So for that, like I mentioned, it's just going to be laid directly on the print bed. And uh, you have to remember this is uh, upside down, right? And to simulate that, since we won't need to prepare any supports, I'm gonna run this with zero supports. There's no real undercuts that are gonna be problematic. Um, we're just gonna export it directly. Um, but first let's simulate what that's gonna look like. And um, we'll be running this on the Piapoli Phenom. All right, so in the simulator, you can see quickly how that print platform is lowered into the tank. And as it prints, it's just gonna come straight off the tank directly on the build plate. We're not going to have any supports removed and all of that fun stuff. And to give you an idea of the scale of this, and there you go. There's the banana and the Pepsi can. So it's about a foot wide, almost a foot wide. I'd say about 11 and a half inches. So that said, um, let's slice this, put it over on the Piopoli and get the sink printed. All right, so I don't have footage of actually printing it on the Piapoli Phenom, but here's my Phenom um, because it looks cool. And the end result is this translucent and rigid body that turns out great. Clean it in IPA, and you can see it's very translucent. You can see through it, and this is using the Smoke Black Fast Resin by Soriatech, uh, which I love using. You can print really quick. It took about two hours to print this, um, but we need it to be black, and for that, we're going to use this Wheeler Ceramic Coat which is a ceramic infused formulation that cross links with the base material. And it's highly resistant to scratching and chipping and primarily used for guns. But in this case, it works great on these sort of handheld devices that can easily get damaged. That said, the final product is applied to it and it's baked in an oven for two hours. And the end result is this matte black finish that feels like a powder coat coating. It's really nice uh, and it's very durable. So that's why I like to use it on these projects. Um, this is the completed base and it looks pretty good. All right, back in Fusion 360, let's unisolate the base. I think that's pretty much it. Um, let's un unisolate the grid, the matrix, the base. So those are all the parts that need to be generated to assemble this thing. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that look at the fabrication of all the parts going into the pond cave. Now there's a lot of work that goes into uh, producing these things and a lot of different machines required to do that. But I think we're there. We're mostly there. We don't have the right acrylic 
that's going to be ordered by Tap Plastics. The uh, Adafruit acrylic isn't going to work for the aesthetics that I was going for. We did mill the, the body as well as the base. The base coated in that nice ceramic coating, so it gives it a great finish and its durability. Um, but it's going to be after Christmas before we get to complete this project. Unfortunately, you know, uh, in the past, JLC PCB has been able to deliver boards in two days once they finish production. Unfortunately, this year, I heard they finished production on Friday, and they're saying it's not going to be delivered until the 27th, which is going to push it out beyond Christmas, which is unfortunate. Uh, it's either a supply chain issue or it's because it's a week before Christmas, um, or probably both. That said, we'll follow up at that point um, um, for the final assembly and we'll upload the logic. In the meantime, I'll probably be working on some of the software. Um, we'll maybe do another video to share the logic, finite state machine that goes into the ESP8266 to make all of the magic sort of come alive and make it a you know a fun and interactive desktop toy. That said, if you're new here, subscribe to the channel. It helps support. If you want to support it more, then head over to the Patreon become a subscriber, you get access to all the design files and models and um, any specific information that you need to take these projects on yourself. Got some new concepts in the new year, um, some ideas around full stack project development and a community. And so lots of fun stuff uh, ahead. So there'll probably be a couple more videos this year, but I probably won't see you before um, Christmas holidays. So hopefully you get the opportunity to spend the Christmas holiday with friends and family over food and wine and have a great time. In the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also allow me to bring better content. Also check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there too.